Okay. Okay. So, uh, good morning, everyone. I'm Helvi Vitek. I'm an assistant professor at the University of Illinois, uh, an expert in uh, numerical relativity uh, with applications to fundamental physics and beyond GR. So you just saw a little bit of advertisement for our code library. Before I uh, start, I'm actually very pleased to welcome so many of you from around the globe. And I wanted to have a very quick, um, like just raise hand question. Um, who of you is a completely new user to the Einstein toolkit and who has never heard about numerical relativity? So, uh, exactly. So, those people, please raise their hands so that I get a bit of an idea who is with us here today. Okay, wonderful. So I'm very happy to see so many new users and interested uh, researchers who want to learn about numerical relativity. So second group, uh, who has already used a little bit of the Einstein toolkit um, or has heard about numerical relativity but has not yet uh, developed code by themselves? Okay, brilliant. So also very warm welcome uh, to you. And of course, to those who are already experts on uh, numerical relativity and uh, Lianz and Toolkit, very warm welcome to you as well. Um, today uh, in the morning or now in this uh, first session, I will give you a bit of an overview of uh, the main ideas, the main theoretical concepts in numerical relativity. That is how do we solve Einstein's equations or modifications thereof um, in three plus one dimensions as a time evolution problem, which typically means that we uh, will use high performance computing facilities. So uh, the first lecture uh, today is really kind of an overview of the basics um, that you will need. So, um, uh, and I designed this as a, um, well, not blackboard, but uh, iPad um, lecture. I would also uh, like to welcome you to ask questions in between. So you can always interrupt me, just unmute yourself and interrupt me. If you're more comfortable to post your question in the chat, please do so. And I would ask Roland and um, yourself to just monitor the Zoom, uh, Zoom chat in case there are any questions. And the last thing before actually going to my notebook uh, is the following. So usually at this stage, I would give you a list of applications um, where we use numerical relativity to uh, uh, simulate and to study the nonlinear strong field regime of gravity. But I thought today uh, I would pose this question actually to you. So what do you think uh, where we have applications for numerical relativity? Or is there even a topic where you say, oh, I'm interested in that and I can see that as an application uh, for me. So just unmute yourself and uh, throw uh, uh, your favorite topic at me. Simulation of coalescent binaries. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that is kind of the main application. Um, yeah, we also have in the chat someone saying uh, black hole neutron star binary merges. That's absolutely correct. Um, what else? So uh, maybe the, uh, the fluid dynamics uh, of uh, CF combiner disks uh, in uh, active galactic nuclei and uh, in uh, massive black hole binary mergers. Yep, excellent. Um, looking at the chat, I see um, early universe cosmology, absolutely, uh, accretion disk gravitational waves, critical collapse, all of these uh, and more even. Um, yeah, cosmology again. Uh, and the other applications that I can think of, or maybe I'm a little bit biased as well. So uh, for example, my group is using numerical relativity to study um, fundamental fields, fundamental particles that are dark, uh, can be dark matter candidates. We are interested in uh, testing gravity and the strong field regime, exactly, Matt is uh, saying modified gravity. Um, 
I can think about simulations of high dimensional black holes and uh, studying speckle stability. So that is a very uh, theoretical uh, application uh, in black hole physics. I can think about space times with, for example, uh, anti digital um, boundary conditions that are interesting in the context of the ADS CFT correspondence and so on and so forth. So there is a wealth of applications. I think in this meeting, uh, we will see mostly applications to uh, simulate and model gravitational wave sources. Um, and uh, neutron star binaries, which actually, uh, again, has new applications in the context of uh, nuclear theory. Quick question. Uh, J uh, so one of you is saying that they can't hear anything. Uh, can everyone else hear me? Just a quick yes or no. Yes, we can hear you. Okay. Yes. yes. Yep. I'll, at least me. Thank you. Okay. Very good. So um, with this uh, short overview, uh, let's go to uh, the tablet. And as I said before, um, if you do have any questions, uh, just interrupt me. So let me share. Screen. Yes. So. Okay, so I uh, already prepared uh, a little bit of the notes for today. Um, and we are uh, here in the introduction for numerical relativity. As I said before, this is really just a two, two hour taster. So of course I cannot in any means uh, cover the entire topic. Um, so if you want to learn more, uh, if you want to go into the details, here are some uh, excellent textbooks by uh, Miguel Alcubier, by Thomas uh, Baumgart and Stu Shapiro, who had a, a recent new book uh, that was published in, in spring, and Masaru uh, Shibata as well. Yeah, so if you want to learn any of the details, uh, I re strongly recommend to go to this book, or these books. Okay, good. So... Uh, just as introduction, um, let me just note down what I said uh, a couple of minutes ago. So what is numerical relativity? And let me use NR to abbreviate numerical relativity. Um, so typically what we mean by that is uh, solving Einstein's equations or extensions thereof. Um, in three plus one dimensions uh, as a time evolution problem. And that typically means um, that we uh, need to resort to a high performance computing facility, HPC. Okay. Yeah, then uh, the applications, uh, again, let me just note some of those downs. And of course, this list is not uh, necessarily complete. So the uh, traditional application uh, we already said is gravitational wave uh, modeling. Yeah, and in particular, if you uh, think about the uh, typical evolution of a compact Let me uh, unmute again. Um, so typically what you have in a compact binary um, is an early phase uh, where velocities are still very small, where we can use um, perturbative methods, post-Newtonian methods, uh, to solve for the problem. As the binary gets close to each other, uh, nonlinear effects become important and we really need to uh, resort to numerical relativity. And then after the merger, the final object, um, if it's a black hole, will just uh, ring down similarly to a bell that may be hit and is emitting uh, waves that uh, uh, oscillate and that decay uh, over time. So um, if I look at this uh, as a waveform, so say uh, our strain here as a function of time, we would have this kind of early in spiral phase where the um, frequency uh, and amplitude increase over time as the binary gets closer and closer together. Um, till we enter the merger 
and then the ring down. Yeah, so here we have fast separations, velocities are small, and we can use post-Newtonian theory. Then we enter the merger regime where everything is highly nonlinear, uh, and we need numerical relativity. And then we have the ring down um, where we can use perturbation theory, and what we also cover with uh, numerical relativity. Okay. And here, of course, we already had that uh, in the discussion and in the chat, typical sources for uh, ground-based detectors, such as uh, LIGO, would be um, stellar mass, black hole plus black hole, neutron star plus neutron star, or neutron star plus uh, black hole, like the recent um, announcements. Um, in the future, if uh, we're looking forward to the space-based uh, missions, such as LISA, we actually get a, a set of new sources, um, such as, well, the, not new sources, but uh, binary mergers of uh, massive black holes. We will also have uh, extreme mass ratio in spirals or short emery. It's like a, a small object orbiting around the supermassive black hole uh, for many, many orbits uh, where we actually have to um, use self force calculation. So we will have a presentation by Peter Dina on uh, Thursday um, on his uh, new code to do this. We expect uh, to either measure or constrain stochastic backgrounds. So um, for example, from cosmological sources, Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. Okay, and then uh, just to complete the list, um, other applications include um, black holes plus light fields um, to study uh, particle physics in a regime that is complementary to traditional uh, particle colliders or direct detection experiments. So, if we think about dark matter, it's dark matter. We're talking about strong field tests of gravity and modified gravity. Um, they haven't listed above Oops. where accretion disks. Jet formation, etc. We have cosmology. And here we can actually think about different applications. So we've talked about early universe cosmology and inflation. We can also uh, probe for cosmic strings and simulate those. Um, oops. Yeah. Can think about high dimensions. ADS CFT. Black hole stability in the nonlinear regime, and so on and so forth. Yeah, so there's a wealth of application beyond um, gravitational wave source modeling, where numerical relativity has become extremely important over the last uh, few years. So uh, for today, I will focus on this main application, and I will actually go through um, the main ingredients that we need if you want to. Uh, develop a uh, numerical relativity code for uh, gravitational wave source modeling. And then, uh, so we will use that as kind of an overview of what's uh, on the plate for today. And then I will uh, start giving you a bit more details uh, on some of these uh, topics. So what do we actually need if we, um, on, the, on the theoretical level, if you want to uh, develop a numerical relativity code before even thinking about implementing that? Um, we would start um, with the following. So let me just label that as ingredients, the theoretical ingredients. And a lot of um, these items will actually carry over um, as uh, we may go to uh, other theories of gravity or other contexts. So uh, the first step, of course, is to have some theoretical model. So which is actually the 
field equations that I want to solve. Oops. So what we have today is just plain Einstein's equations in vacuum in four dimensions. And I should add uh, asymptotically flat space times. Yeah. So this is kind of the vanilla uh, um, uh, version. And this is what already gives us a lot of rich uh, physics. So um, what we will solve and look at are just Einstein's equations in vacuum. Equals zero. Uh, we will see extensions to include matter, uh, for example, for neutron star simulations over the next two days. So um, I hope you will be patient enough um, to learn about that uh, tomorrow. So once we have our model, then we can actually go ahead and think about um, how to describe our space time. In particular, if you want to uh, uh, write Einstein's equations as a a uh, time evolution problem, then we need to uh, decompose our space time uh, explicitly. So, space time decomposition. Once we have done that for um, our space time, we actually uh, will apply this uh, three plus one, so space time decomposition for the field equations. then we will have to think about uh, initial conditions for our metric. Yeah, so what is actually the physical problem uh, that we want to solve and uh, what is the initial data? Then we need to think about um, choices for uh, the gauge. So how do we actually describe our coordinates in such a way that our numerical simulation is stable and will turn out um, that the easiest, mo most obvious choice may not be the best um, for uh, to get a, numer a stable numerical scheme. So, oops. and of course, um, the very last, oops, sorry, the very last one. So, having done all of that and uh, being able to perform a simulation is one thing, but we also want to extract physical observables. Um, such as uh, the gravitational wave perturbation. So typically um, we extract Newman Penrose scalars. So these are uh, perturbations, uh, gravitational wave perturbations. Uh, and they are related to uh, the strain, which is observable that we actually measure with our detector. Uh, we also want to understand um, local quantity. So for example, uh, what are the properties of our black hole? So we would typically um, extract apparent or information about the apparent or isolated horizons, which are uh, concepts that are local in time and therefore can be uh, extracted at every step in your uh, time evolution. Okay. So these are the main steps. What I will focus on today, uh, given the time that we have, uh, is this very first one here. So the uh, space-time decomposition, the decomposition for the field equations, plus a little discussion on um, well-posedness and specific evolution schemes. Okay, I will touch upon just brief example for initial conditions and I will touch upon gauge choices. Again, just in a kind of one or two examples um, that we typically use and that are implemented in the Einstein toolkit. I should probably uh, repeat that. So especially for the initial conditions, I will focus on those that are uh, implemented in the Einstein toolkit. Uh, there are of course other constructions as well, but just for you to know what to look for when you're uh, looking at the toolkit and looking at the code, um, that's what you should be able to recover. Okay, very good. So with all that set and uh, set up, let me just dive into the very first uh, topic. So uh, decomposing our four-dimensional space-time into spatial hypersurfaces that are uh, evolved in time. Good. 
and do I have enough space to do this? Yeah. So, and the reason for us to do this is that we really want to make uh, the time dependence uh, of our quantities of our metric uh, explicit uh, again. So, um, first topic is three plus one decomposition of our space time. And again, this part is actually uh, completely independent of any of the theories uh, that you may consider. So if you have a four dimensional asymptotically flat space time um, uh, that's globally hyperbolic, then you can uh, just straightforwardly apply this uh, uh, decomposition that I'm presenting to you now. And all the dynamics, all the dependence on the field equations will come in the next chapter when we actually apply this decomposition to our field equations. Okay, and what we are uh, going to do is, um, as I said, the goal is to make the time dependence explicit again. And we uh, therefore foliate our four dimensional space time into space like hypersurfaces that are then labeled by a time parameter. Yeah. So foliate our four dimensional space time manifold. Let me call that curly M with some metric little g uh, into space like hypersurfaces. Let me call them sigma with some level parameter t, which will become the time parameter. Uh, and a metric on these hypersurfaces that we typically call uh, gamma um, with some level sets. Okay, good. So if I illustrate that, um, we will have the following. So we will foliate our space time into these uh, hypersurfaces. Let me just draw one here. As I said, I will call this uh, sigma t and it will come with some metric uh, gamma that is uh, on our hypersurface sigma. We have this, uh, what we call the induced spatial metric gamma that measures uh, the proper distance in um, this hypersurface. that is um, a DL squared, so a line uh, element in this hypersurface would be given by gamma ij dxi dxj. Just a note on notation here. Um, so I've used the uh, Greek indices before. These are space-time indices going from zero to three. These i and j, I will, uh, so Latin indices I will use explicitly if we are dealing with uh, spatial indices. Okay, good. So that's on one of those slices. Um, as I said, we want to actually foliate our entire space time with those. So we have our time parameter T here. We define uh, now a normal vector in mu, which is time-like. Oops. So time like normal vector and mu um, defined such that uh, the norm of this vector is minus one. Okay. And now if you want to describe um, how we go from this one slice that I've drawn here to the next one, that I'm drawing now. So let's label that as some sigma t plus delta t. Then we can introduce the following quantities. So first of all, we can introduce uh, what we call the lapse function, which essentially tells us how much time elapses from one slice to the next. 
if we follow um, along uh, the normal uh, observer. So I, this here is this alpha n. So uh, alpha is called the lapse function. And that uh, indicates the proper time um, between our hypersurfaces. for an observer moving along the normal. Oops. Okay, but that's not all yet because uh, we can imagine that a point uh, here on sigma t may actually correspond to um, a point p prime here that is um, it will be shifted as compared to just moving along our normal vector. Or in other words, let me use uh, maybe blue here. So uh, we will have a shift um, as compared um, to the point that we would reach if we just move along the normal vector. So this kind of gives us a relative velocity uh, between the normal observer and uh, lines of constant uh, spatial coordinates. And this we typically call uh, beta i as the shift vector. So as I said, this is a relative velocity between um, the normal observer and uh, const lines of constant um, spatial coordinates. Okay, and now we can actually uh, use those to construct a time-like vector um, here. Oops just call this t mu. So this uh, would be given by lapse function times a normal vector plus beta mu. And what I haven't told you about the shift vector yet is that just by construction, um, the uh, shift vector is uh, orthogonal to the normal vector. So we have um, beta mu n mu equals uh, zero by construction or by definition. Okay. Um, yeah. So if we uh, now want to uh, connect these uh, three plus one quantities, so the uh, induced or spatial metric gamma ij, lapse uh, and shift. To reconstruct our four-dimensional metric, we uh, would have the following uh, relation. Let me just write this uh, down on the next slide. Yeah. Okay, so um, yeah, so this would be the relation between the four-dimensional metric. Oops. And uh, the three dimensional quantities gamma ij, uh, labs, and shift. So we would have our line element, the four dimensional line element that is g mu nu dx mu dx nu. And this could be related to those quantities by minus alpha squared. Oops, and this should be a minus here. Uh, the norm uh, of the uh, shift vector. So the three-dimensional norm, gamma ij, beta i, beta j, dt squared plus two gamma ij, beta i, dt, dxj. And then we have our uh, spatial uh, part, gamma ij, dxi, 
dxj. Yeah. So I have a couple of notes uh, to make here. So first of all, it turns out, um, or uh, you can actually relate this um, spatial induced metric, uh, gamma mu, uh, let me write it as gamma mu nu um, in, in general. So this can be related to the four dimensional metric plus normal vector n mu, normal vector n mu. It also turns out that um, our induced metric defines a projection operator. Um, so if I write it in this form, gamma upper index mu, lower index nu, this would be uh, the four dimensional uh, chronicle identity matrix plus n mu and new. So if I apply this projection operator onto a four dimensional uh, vector or tensor, I can actually um, project out um, components that are uh, only uh, in the spatial uh, hypersurface. And in particular, if I uh, just give you an example for a vector, so any vector, uh, let's call that uh, V mu, can be decomposed. into a, a normal component whereby I mean um, let me call this just n um, the normal the, the vector uh, mu contracted with our normal vector coming with a minus sign because uh, of our conventions and then we can uh, introduce the spatial um, components, let me call them uh, VI, and they uh, would precisely be constructed with, con with this uh, projection operator, gamma I mu acting on our vector V mu. That is, uh, we can write our vector V mu as this normal component times the uh, normal vector N mu plus this, uh, projected uh, spatial component. And let me just, uh, for consistency, uh, write it as a four dimensional vector um, that is by construction um, orthogonal to the normal vector. Okay, good. Then uh, the other quantity that we uh, will see is actually uh, the covariant derivative with respect to our spatial metric. So this is more for completeness. So we can introduce the covariant derivative with respect to uh, our spatial metric. And I will typically use a capital D uh, for this. And this would be given um, by gamma applied uh, on our four dimensional covariant derivative. So we are projecting out um, the uh, respective components uh, here. And then, of course, we can define the uh, Ricci that is intrinsic curvature to our hypersurface. And here, um, again, I will uh, use Latin indices so we can uh, look at the commutator, say, uh, capital D, dm, dn, minus dn, dm, acting on uh, some uh, spatial vector, let me call this VK, then the Riemann tensor, the three-dimensional Riemann tensor would be uh, R, K, L, M, N, V, L. Okay, so now we have uh, described our coordinates and we basically described uh, quantities um, or described our foliation, there's one uh, more item that we uh, need to consider, need to understand, and that is uh, how our hypersurfaces are embedded in our spacetime. So we will not always have some uh, this flat hypersurfaces, the hypersurface will be curved, and how this uh, hypersurface is curved is described by the extrinsic curvature. So 
um, that's the last uh, quantity that we need to completely describe our space time. Um, the extrinsic curvature. Typically call this uh, KIJ or and think of it in the following way. So uh, say we have some hypersurface, let me just uh, suppress uh, two dimensions and um, draw it in this form. And let's say we have one of our normal vectors uh, here. As we tra parallel transport this normal vector uh, along our hypersurface, it um, will of course um, pick up uh, a gradient. So essentially, um, the extrinsic curvature if in, in as a geometric concept measures uh, the change uh, of the normal vector as it is tra parallel transported along um, our hypersurface. Yeah, so um, parallel transport uh, normal vector uh, along our hypersurface sigma t, and the um, extrinsic curvature, oops, um, okay. thinking faster than I'm writing. So the extrinsic curvature is a measure for the change of the normal vector. So that uh, is sorry, a quick question. Yep. Um, do you really mean parallel transport here, or isn't it more that uh, you measure the covariant derivative of the normal vector along uh, in the direction um, ta um, tangential to this hypersurface? That's what we do, exactly. So this is exactly the definition that I'm uh, writing down now. Um, yeah, so the uh, extrinsic curvature is precisely um, that uh, projection of the gradient uh, or uh, the covariant derivative of um, the normal vector. Let me just use kappa here. And the convention that we are using here for the uh, sign is a minus sign such that um, our normal vector is uh, indeed directed uh, to uh, the future. Yeah, so <clears throat> this is how we would uh, define the extrinsic curvature uh, geometrically. You can also um, show the following. And in fact, in um, some numerical relativity textbooks, uh, you would find that as a definition, um, but there's um, a relation between the two. So you can show that the extrinsic curvature, uh, k mu nu, can be related to minus one over two alpha. And then we have a lead derivative along the normal vector here um, of our induced metric, or uh, if I write this out, this uh, can be related to the time derivative minus a lead derivative along the shift vector of our metric here. So if you think, uh, <clears throat> or if you look at this uh, second um, relation, then you can see that we can um, interpret k mu nu, the extrinsic curvature as uh, kind of a momentum Um, to the metric. And in fact, if we uh, rearrange uh, this uh, second equation, we find um, that uh, the time derivative of the metric is indeed given by minus two alpha k mean nu. Uh, and actually now, since we're dealing with spatial quantities um, in adapted coordinates, we can actually write here uh, time derivative of gamma ij is minus two alpha kij plus the lead derivative along the shift vector of our metric. So this gives us a first time evolution equation, which is a kinematic equation. So if you think about your uh, classical mechanics courses, this would essentially be uh, the um, uh, time so the velocity equation so x dot equals some velocity or some momentum um, and that's uh, precisely the uh, 
uh, analog uh, of that. So this is just a kinematic uh, equation. Yeah, so um, if we summarize what we have had in this uh, section here is that we describe our space time Uh, in terms of these three-dimensional uh, quantities, uh, induced metric, lapse, and shift, together with extrinsic curvature, uh, which is related to the time derivative of our metric. Okay, and this kind of uh, decomposition is actually um, valid for uh, any globally hyperbolic space-time, mostly. Um, and is completely independent of the specific theory that you may want to study. Okay. So do we have any more questions uh, at this stage before I actually continue um, and apply this to Einstein's equations? Okay, very good. <clears throat> so the next step is how do we get the uh, dynamics of our system, uh, the dynamics of <clears throat> our equations in, and that's by decomposing um, Einstein's equations or the field equations that you're interested in uh, uh, as a time evolution problem as well. So that will be the next chapter and actually also be on the next page. So here uh, we look at the three plus one decomposition of the field equations. I'm not going to go um, so I'm not going to go into any of the details of how you derive them. Yeah, so that's something that you can check in the textbooks. Um, so I will rather give you some key steps, <clears throat> sorry, some key steps and the final result, just in the inter interest of time, um, I won't go uh, and discuss any of the derivation. If you want to practice for yourself or if you want to actually uh, um, use it to learn, uh, for example, extensor, which I usually use for these kind of uh, decompositions, then uh, I'm happy to give you advice or help if you uh, join us for any of the tutorials. Um, or tutorial uh, questions in the morning, but I'm, I'm not going to show that uh, here. Okay, so as I said, um, if we want to get the dynamics in, dynamical evolution, um, and we need uh, <clears throat> three main uh, steps. So the first one are the projections of the Riemann tensor. Uh, and Ricci uh, tensor Ricci scalar. That is, we need a relation between um, the four dimensional uh, Riemann tensor. Let me make this explicit by adding a four here. And the three-dimensional quantities, let me make this explicit by adding a little three here, um, rho sigma. Again, I'm not going to write out uh, these relations, but you can find them under um, the name Gauss-Kodatsi uh, equations. Oops, I'm a typo here. So Gauss-Kodatsi uh, relations. Okay, uh, and what I mean by projections is what I said before, what I gave you in the example for the vector is that we uh, identify um, or project out uh, in every index now, um, the quantities that are um, orthogonal uh, to the hypersurface and those that are tangential to the hypersurface. Yeah, so once we have that for the uh, Riemann tensor, we would do <clears throat> the same for the energy momentum tensor if we want to look at uh, space-times with matter, 
fields. And just in case you will see this tomorrow, um, if I think about, uh, so if I take um, an energy momentum tensor T mu nu, then I could look at three different projections. So I could find um, what we call the energy density. Let me call this rho, which is just a contraction of the energy momentum tensor uh, with a normal vector in both indices. Then we could have uh, the energy momentum flux. I will typically call that J I, and this is minus um, the projection of one index of the energy momentum tensor onto the hypersurface. So, and the other one contracted along uh, the normal vector. And then we have the stress tensor, which is, which is uh, completely spatial, typically called as SIJ. And here we are projecting uh, both indices of the energy momentum tensor onto our hypersurface. Okay, so that's uh, the only place or almost where you will see those quantities here, but I believe that uh, in the lectures and tutorials tomorrow, uh, you will uh, see them again. Okay, and then, of course, uh, the final uh, step is to uh, project our field equations. And uh, for us today, as I said, we just uh, look at Einstein's equations in vacuum. So here we just use g mu nu equals to zero. And if we uh, perform uh, those projections, we will actually find two types uh, of equations or sets, sets of uh, partial differential equations. In particular, if uh, one or both indices of uh, Einstein's equations are contracted with a normal vector, then we find a set of um, elliptic type equations that are um, time independent, and those are the constraint equations uh, of general relativity. So if we uh, decompose, oops. Um, we decompose those equations, uh, the first set that we get are the constraint equations and in particular, we find um, what we call the Hamiltonian constraint, which is uh, twice the Einstein tensor or the field equations uh, contracted with a normal vector equals to zero. And if I write this out, um, this actually uh, gives us a three-dimensional Ricci scalar minus this combination of uh, extrinsic curvature squared uh, type terms. So this is a Hamiltonian constraint. The second constraint that we get, uh, we typically call momentum constraint. Let me call this curly MI. And here we are uh, projecting one of the indices of our field equations onto the hypersurface and the other one is contracted with uh, the normal vector. So here we have um, G mu nu, one index contracted with the normal, the other one projected uh, with our projection operator. If we do that, if we uh, uh, write this out, we will find um, the divergence of the extrinsic curvature, so dj kij minus the derivative of the trace of the extrinsic curvature equals to zero. Um, so that's the momentum constraint. And just for notation, k is the trace of the extrinsic curvature, so gamma ij. Kij. And as I said, um, these are um, elliptic type equations.
And typically uh, what we do is um, solve these constraints to construct our initial conditions uh, and for our initial conditions only. So in numerical relativity, we typically only uh, solve those initially and then um, monitor uh, whether these constraints are satisfied uh, throughout the evolution. So I think uh, there's a question uh, in the chat. Um, yeah, okay. Uh, yeah, so Alexandra is asking um, uh, about the constraints from and onto the hypersurface. So remember, just a little bit further up, I uh, said that if you have, let me just go there again, that if we have a, a vector, right, um, let me see. So uh, here, I said, if you have a vector, we can actually isolate um, components of this vector that are tangential to our hypersurface and uh, components that are uh, orthogonal to our uh, uh, hypersurface. Yeah. Uh, and what we uh, are doing now is this kind of decomposition that I uh, wrote down here for each index in our field equations. Um, and it turns out that if you, um, so if you take Einstein's equations and then uh, contract one or both of those indices with a normal vector, you will find uh, the, uh, the time independent uh, equations that I've written down that are the constraints. So if you want an analogy, think about uh, Maxwell's equations, where you also can write down your four dimensional uh, uh, covariant Maxwell uh, uh, equations, and you can uh, recover the uh, Maxwell constraint equations like uh, divergence of E and divergence of B by uh, projecting your four dimensional equations, uh, sorry, by, by uh, uh, contracting them with a normal vector. So is that a little bit clearer, Alexandra? Okay, very good. Um, then uh, Mert is asking if we are following a specific textbook here. Uh, not exactly. So I uh, listed three textbooks, four textbooks actually in the very beginning. Um, I'm mostly following Miguel Alcubierre's book, but it's really a collection and um, of information from different textbooks. Um, and essentially a, a series of lectures that I've uh, given before. It's just in a very, very condensed form now. Um, so if you want to look at any of the details, um, either of the four textbooks um, is really excellent um, to, to look at. Yeah, so if you want to know any of the details, I recommend you go there. If you have any questions, uh, either ask me in the break or come join us in the uh, tutorial sessions or uh, question sessions uh, every morning. Okay, good. So let me uh, go back. Oops. Okay, so as I said, we get uh, these constraint equations by um, contracting uh, our Einstein's equations with a normal vector in one or both indices. So the resulting equations that we uh, get here are time independent, they're elliptic equations. And as I was saying, um, in a free evolution scheme, which is what we typically uh, adopt in numerical relativity, um, we solve uh, the constraints H, so the uh, Hamiltonian momentum constraint for the initial data. And then monitor Um, that they are satisfied with a numerical error at least uh, during the evolution. Yeah, and one can actually show maybe as a final note, uh, and that's why we can uh, do this. Um, that uh, so, if you um, use the Bianchi identities, you can show uh, that. Uh, if the constraints are satisfied uh, initially at uh, time equal zero, and uh, you evolve according to uh, the field equations, then the constraints will remain satisfied, uh, at least at a theoretical level, um, 
during your uh, evolution. So the Bianchi identities imply that the constraints remain satisfied if they are satisfied in your initial data. Okay, very good. Yeah, so this is the first set of equations that we get. Now, um, the last uh, type of projection uh, is those very uh, project the Einstein tensor uh, onto the hypersurface in both indices, and that will actually give us uh, a set of evolution equations. So, um, okay. Yeah, so what we're doing here is um, project uh, the Einstein tensor. Oh, and let me just, no, that's fine. Um, in both indices uh, onto the hypersurface. Um, okay. And um, that will essentially give us a lead derivative along the normal that is a time derivative for the extrinsic curvature. Now, um, I can rearrange this to get uh, the following. We have uh, time derivative minus the lead derivative along beta of the extrinsic curvature. And that would be uh, given by minus second spatial covariant derivative so di dj of our laps plus laps times the three-dimensional uh, Ricci tensor rij. And I'm not, so I'm dropping now the uh, little threes uh, here just to make it more readable. Plus the trace of the extrinsic curvature times extrinsic curvature itself minus this combination ki k k kg. Okay, so that is our dynamical evolution equation. And remember, we have found before so this is the dynamics. And remember, we have found a kinematic uh, equation before. So we, where we had the time derivative minus the lead derivative along beta of the metric equals minus two alpha kij. So these are now our complete uh, evolution equations um, for Einstein's equations in three plus one form. In numerical relativity, oops, sorry, uh, we typically refer to these equations as ADM, so Arno with Desa Misna, or ADM York equations. Um, Yeah, so where this stands for Arnovit, Desa, and Misna. Just one uh, note of caution. So the original ADM equations were actually written down in terms of uh, conjugated momenta. They can be related to uh, the three metric and extrinsic curvature that we have written down uh, here. Yeah. Um, and I think we just uh, refer to these equations typically as ADM or ADM York equations in numerical relativity. Okay, let me just take a small break. I think there are more comments on the chat or if you have any questions and want to speak up. Um, yeah, so there's actually, uh, yeah, uh, Ramesh, uh, uh, thanks for um, the suggestion or the, the notes. So there's actually also a very nice set of lecture notes by uh, Eric Ogleyong on the three plus one formulation, um, which is available on the archive. 
Um, so if you uh, follow the name and title, you should find uh, these lecture notes. They're generally excellent. Okay. Do we have any questions here at this stage? Good. If not, um, I will talk about one more topic before we take a little break, um, which is related to um, the uh, well posedness of uh, this set of equations that we've just derived um, and how we can actually uh, um, put them in a form so that we can uh, evolve Einstein's equations uh, stably and uh, study uh, black hole binaries or compact binaries, for example. Because if you have time um, you know, and uh, want to implement these equations here, you can do that and then you can take the simplest space time that you can think of. So take flat space time, just put a small perturbation on top and try to evolve that in three plus one dimension with the equations that I've written down here. What you will see is that um, your uh, simulation will very quickly blow up um, and develop uh, divergences and that is uh, not necessarily because there's a bug in the code, but it's because on a mathematical level, the equations that we've written down here um, are actually what we would call ill posed as a partial differential, uh, a set of partial differential equations. So I'll take a few moments now to uh, give you a definition of what is well posedness and then uh, a layperson's definition of what is well posedness, which is good enough for what we want to look at uh, here today. And then how we can actually modify the equations that I've written down here to um, get the stable evolutions that we uh, know and love. Okay, so it's on the next page. Yeah, so uh, I think that should be uh, the third part now. Yeah. Uh, well, posedness of the evolution equations. And I'm uh, making this note because uh, having this well mathematical well posed set of evolution equations is really a necessary condition for numerical stability. Um, so if you don't have this property, then uh, any simulation uh, would just fail. And as I said, this is not actually a statement about the theory of gravity uh, as uh, sometimes uh, uh, used, but it's really a statement about the uh, way the equations are written down. Yeah, so as I said, even in, in, even in general relativity that we know and love, um, if you write down Einstein's equations in the wrong way um, and implement that, then um, your simulations can fail because of this uh, ill-posedness. Uh, so what do I actually mean by well-posed set of equations? So let's start with a little, uh, defini oops, little definition here. Yeah, so if we have a, a system of partial differential equations in the following form. And this is very schematic that we say we have the time derivative of a vector or a tensor of uh, variables equals to some coefficient matrix AP spatial derivatives of our uh, vector of variables plus uh, these lower order terms and we have complemented with initial conditions for our vector of variables let's just call that a uh, little h and um, just for notation so f is a vector of variables that we want oops, variables that we want to evolve This dp are spatial derivatives and this matrix AP can be related to what we call the principal symbol or the highest derivatives um, 
of our equations. So if you have a system of partial differential equations in this form, um, then it is said to be well posed. If there exists a unique solution that depends continuously on uh, smooth initial data. So this is a mathematical definition. And in particular, um, you can uh, call a system uh, well post if we have two uh, constants. So say one constant capital K, Oh, actually, let me call this little k to not confuse it with our extrinsic curvature. And say another constant, uh, little a, such that our uh, vector of variables at a time t, so the norm of that vector at a time t, is bounded by uh, the initial data. So it cannot grow faster than exponentially. Um, where uh, we have here our uh, constants, k and a. Uh, and then here we have the initial uh, data for vector variables. So that's the mathematical form. In practice and for the discussion here, um, all I will say is that um, we know that uh, wave equations are a well-posed hyperbolic system of equations. So what we are going to look for uh, essentially is uh, a way of writing Einstein's equations in a form that is as similar as possible to uh, the wave equation. And then uh, if someone is interested, uh, one can actually uh, show that uh, at least certain formulations of Einstein's equations satisfy uh, these definitions of uh, well-posedness. And in particular, um, it has been proven for Einstein's equation plus a harmonic gauge. So uh, a gauge where um, we have a wave equation for the coordinates um, that, these, uh, that, that this is well-posed. And that was shown by Madame Shoki Praha back in the uh, 1950s, early 1960s. Okay, so just note this down and then we can make a couple of uh, comparisons. So let me just say the layperson version. We want to recover a set of wave equations. Okay. Yes, so this is essentially the Cauchy problem in GR um, in a slightly different uh, form. Yeah, well, uh, yeah, so essentially what I'm uh, talking about here is that if we have a time evolution or Cauchy problem in general relativity, we still want to make sure that this is uh, a well posed hyperbolic problem. Yeah. So um, now let's be a little bit heuristic. Um, and let's, uh, so yeah, a little bit heuristic and I will just look at the uh, leading order terms in both Einstein's equations and the scalar field wave equation as comparison because that's where we uh, understand all these properties very well. Yeah, so let's take here the scalar wave equation So some uh, D'Alembertian acting on a scalar field phi equals to zero. So that's kind of the prime example for uh, an hy a hyperbolic equation. Now, if we look at Einstein's equations equals to zero, so let's just stay in vacuum. Um, and we expand this out 
what we will get is the following. So we will get a wave operator acting on our metric. Beautiful. So this is what we actually want. But we will also get terms um, that structurally are uh, second derivatives of the metric where we may have a form like this. Yeah, and so on and so forth. So these, okay, and of course we will also have terms of this form that I'm just neglecting. But these uh, second derivative terms that are not the wave operator, um, if they are not dealt with properly, um, they can spoil the um, hyperbolic character of uh, the equations or hyperbolicity. So one way out is to say, okay, um, we can actually introduce a harmonic gauge And this is what um, Madame Shri Kebreha had uh, done. And then we indeed uh, find a set of wave equations for the metric plus some lower order terms that we don't worry about. Um, so we have a set of wave equations for our metric. Everything's great now in this three plus one language that we have uh, introduced or that I have introduced in the first hour this morning, um, that is not quite as obvious. And I think, uh, so I'm talking, I'm telling you about this because if I look at the history of numerical relativity, then, um, you know, we're talking about a history of uh, several decades uh, starting in the uh, 60s, early 70s. Um, and I think there was this notion of, oh, you know, we know that Einstein's equations are well posed, so we can just go ahead, do the three plus one decomposition. And then uh, when people started uh, the first simulations in three plus one dimensions, uh, codes would typically blow up, nothing would work. So I, there was a whole um, community dedicated in the 90s and early 2000s to actually make numerical relativity codes uh, to work, get them to work, to simulate Einstein's equations. Um, and I think um, part of what uh, was missing at the time was this mathematical understanding that we need well post uh, hyperbolic equations <clears throat> for numerical stability. And in fact, um, the first breakthrough simulation by uh, Franz Petarius in 2005 used uh, precisely a formulation uh, like this one here, where we uh, where he used a, a generalization of these harmonic, uh, this harmonic gauge um, and then performed the first orbit uh, and merger uh, of rotating black holes. Now, the second version um, that was uh, realized shortly thereafter by uh, groups uh, now in Rochester um, and Nasa Goddard is a slightly different one. And that's the second one that I will talk about. And that's the one that we will, uh, that we have in the Einstein toolkit. And that's, uh, basically, uh, so if we uh, label the first version here as 4D version, then the second version would be like a three plus one version. And again, let's start with a scalar wave equation so that we can compare and see uh, similarities in the structure of the equations. Okay, so if I take my wave equation, I can write it down as a first order in time problem by introducing um, a kind of momentum, let me call this pi equals minus um, some time derivative of the scalar field. And if we do that, um, we can write the scalar wave equation as a set of first order in time, second order in space equations. So we have a time derivative of phi equals to minus pi, just by definition. And if you insert this definition, we can write a time evolution equation for pi that equals minus the Laplacian for the scalar field. Okay, 
Now, let's have a look at the uh, ADM York equations that we uh, derived before. And let me uh, just write down the leading order term. So I will neglect everything that's uh, lower order and uh, derivatives. So uh, leading order. So the first set of equations is a time evolution equation for the three metric um, that goes like the extrinsic curvature itself. So by this analogy, um, you know, we could take the analogy gamma ij versus the scalar field and extrinsic curvature versus this momentum pi. Okay, great. Now, if we write down the time evolution equation for kij, again, only taking leading order terms, we have the second derivative, spatial derivative of the lapse plus lapse times the three dimensional Ricci tensor. And then, as I said, we neglect a bunch of terms here. Now let's write that out a little bit. What we uh, find here is the following. So we still have our second derivative of the lapse plus, and then we find, say, gamma KL, dk dl gamma ij, which is Nice, so this is like our Laplacian, right? Great, so this is a kind of term that we want to have, but we still have these extra terms uh, that come about when we expand the Ricci tensor and they are in uh, form, oops, KL, something like this. So essentially um, a three-dimensional version of what we had before. And then of course, uh, all the other definition, uh, uh, combinations. And these are precisely the terms um, that make our system in this form uh, not well posed. Yeah, so uh, to cure this, we introduce uh, or we make two, uh, we take two steps. So we introduce a new set of uh, variables and we add the constraints. So an equation equals to zero, we add the constraints to these evolution equations such that uh, we get precisely the structure of a wave equation. Okay. And I will just introduce, no, I will just uh, give you the name of those equations. I'm not going to write them down because again, you can um, look them up in the standard uh, textbooks. So uh, we introduce a new set of variables. And uh, we add, constraints Oops. to change um, the character of the PDAs. Oops. And that typically goes, or the resulting equations uh, typically go under Baumgartner, Shapiro, Shibata and Nakamura equations, so BSSN equations. Yeah, and the uh, papers for those are actually, so this is 1995, 1999. Um, and more recent incarnations thereof go under um, Z4, or conformal Z4, where you also add um, constraint uh, damping. But this is kind of the uh, basic uh, formulation. Okay, so I would take a little break here. Um, first of all, if you have any more uh, questions, I would take them now. Otherwise I would say, uh, let's um, take a five minute break and come back at 15 past the hour. Okay, and let me see. Um...
There's one question in the chat. Mm -hmm. It's not directly related to what you presented, um, but it's uh, about evolution inside of anti dissidious space times and how that limits your existence of the solution. Okay, so um, people are indeed um, developing uh, code and have evolved um, black hole space times in asymptotically anti dissidious spaces. Um, so what you would do in this case so, uh, is to derive um, an initial boundary value problem. So all I've been talking here, talking about here is an initial value problem. Um, if you want to uh, perform simulations in uh, anti space spacetimes, you need an initial, well, post initial boundary value problem. So you have to take those into account. Um, but yes, in, uh, in principle, it does work also in uh, ADS. Okay. So maybe I can ask a quick question. Um, so I'm a bit confused about the concepts here um, between uh, well postness, hyperbolicity, numerical stability, and the explosion of the constraint violation, because I never thought of uh, well postness as being violated by the free evolution equation system. But it's rather that if you, depending on how you write it down, ADM or BSSN, uh, the constraint violations evolve a lot different. For example, they exponentially grow in uh, ADM, uh, but that doesn't make it ill-posed, right? For example, if the space-time would be um, time-like at some point, that would be ill-posed. Uh, but um, where, where is it well ill-posed uh, if I just use ADM or the time-like hypersurface? Okay, okay, okay. So uh, there are a few things to bear with me. Um, so uh, for hyperbolicity, there are different notions. Um, there is something that's called uh, weak hyperbolicity and strong hyperbolicity, um, which is essentially uh, has to do with the uh, properties of this uh, of your coefficient matrix. So if you take these uh, evolution equations and uh, just write write down the coefficients in front of each of these uh, derivatives. Uh, then you get a matrix that you can analyze. Um, and the ADM equations uh, are weakly hyperbolic. Fair enough. Um, but the problem is if you uh, try to evolve, uh, as I said, so take, take flat space time, take a little perturbation, um, then in, if you evolve it with, a, with the ADM equations, that will become numerically unstable. So in that sense, a weakly hyperbolic uh, set of equations is not well post. One can show that if you have equations that are strongly hyperbolic, that they are, uh, that they give you a well post uh, initial value formulation. Um, and there's actually a very nice review paper or review lecture notes by David Hilditch. And I believe it's also um, discussed in the uh, living review by Olivier Sava and uh, Manuel Tilio. So this is a bit of, uh, of the relation and the BSSN equations are, you can show that they are strongly hyperbolic um, and therefore well post uh, initial value formulation. Does that answer your question, Wolfgang? Uh, well, maybe we are talking about the same thing in different terms. So I, I would say um, numerical stability has nothing to do with well post net. It's a purely mathematical definition. Of course, if something is ill post, it can't be numerically stable. Exactly. So, um, that's the, so that's the relation. And uh, right? hyperbolicity is uh, a prerequisite for numerical stability, strong hyperbolicity. Exactly. Um, exactly. Yeah, and that's, that's precisely the connection. Um, nevertheless, I, I don't still don't see where exactly the ADM system would be not well posed. I mean, it's uh, mathematically, it's just a PDE. Uh, if you give initial data, it is uh, not uh, growing faster than exponentially, even if you have constraint violations. Oh, but it does. So you can actually show this. Oh, it does. Okay, so that does, that would be the important information. Okay, yeah, okay, yeah. So maybe that's information uh, that you can actually show that uh, the ADM equations written down in the form that I had before um, do grow faster than exponentially um, if you have small perturbations. And what I was doing here in this discussion was more uh, heuristically uh, saying, okay, these are the terms why this is happening. Yeah, so the, the ADM equations are in that sense ill post. And therefore, uh, you know, uh, do not satisfy the necessary conditions that you need for numerical stability. 
right. Uh, can we I go see, yeah, that answer is thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, very good. Uh, okay. Yeah. Can we go back to the definition of well postness? Mm -hmm. So there are two definitions there. Okay, so um, so this is a, uh, this is so a mathematical I, definition, right? So uh, could you explain a little, a little bit more about this uniqueness from this mathematical definition? So I cannot see the uniqueness. So I can understand that uh, from the mathematical definition, it is that smooth, but uh, dependent con continuously on smooth initial data. But I cannot see why it is unique from this mathematical definition. So you, you require a solution to be unique. Yeah, but the, for the for, from the second definition, uh, you can have two solution both depend continuous on the smooth data. So, but then it's not that then then it's not uh, well posed, right? Because what we want here is a system that has predictive power. That if I start with uh, a set of initial data and I evolve that forward in time, then at late times I get a unique solution. So I'm talking about well posed hyperbolic problems here. Yeah. Okay. So then the second definition is not complete. Which second definition? So, so this is this this combined is one definition of um, well posedness, and you can uh, in practice uh, show that if you take uh, this uh, system of equation that I've written down here and you analyze um, the principal symbol, so this um, um, coefficient matrix of the highest derivatives. The second version, this is very heuristic. So this uh, co comparison to the wave equation is more, um, it's, it's much more hands-on and to say, okay, this is what we're actually looking for um, in the structure of the equations. This is, uh, was not a, not a very strict mathematical uh, discussion. Right? Okay, so, so if I can prove that uh, the, the solution satisfies this, uh, uh, this, this relation, then uh, I can say that the, the system is has a unique solution which depend on, on continuous smooth data. Mm. Right. Yeah, so if you have a not, yeah, so if your solution is uh, not unique, then uh, you already, so then you don't satisfy uh, one of the um, requirements for world positiveness. Oh, for well post hyperbolic problems. Let me be more specific here. Yeah, and this is actually an important discussion if you, uh, so for example, if you think about um, extensions of general relativity where some of these conditions um, may not be satisfied. Uh, can, can we uh, say that, suppose that we are talking about a modified uh, theory of gravity mm -hmm. and uh, Maybe I can prove that it satisfies this, uh, this relation, which mm. in equality. Then, um, so as long as they, they, uh, they satisfy this equation, then they are fine. So there will be a unique solution. So that's what yeah. this means, right? Again, the unique solution is a condition for well posedness. Right. Yeah. Okay. So if I have a theory, how do you prove the, the, the uniqueness? So as long as I can just uh, prove this, this equation here, this, this relation here, then. Or... No, I mean, this is uh, something that you have to do separately as well, right? Um, prove uniqueness of solutions. Oh, really? Okay. Okay. Thank mm -hmm. you. Okay. Good. Okay. So I see there are messages in the chat. Anything in particular? Um, or speak up because otherwise I would um, continue. Um, yeah. Okay, so uh, there are actually a number of um, uh, authors. So there's a question in the chat about uh, authors. I will put that uh, in the very end if that's okay. Uh, or just remind me. Uh, do we have any other questions? Okay, because then I would uh, continue um, with the second half of uh, this lecture. So this was all about, so far I was talking all about, um, first of all, uh, writing down Einstein's equations as a first order in time, second order in space uh, evolution system. And we talked a little bit about the mathematical structure again, 
in a very lay person version here, just to give you an idea of, um, of the structure. And the next uh, couple of items that I would like to discuss in the last half an hour that I have here uh, actually related to uh, how do I choose my coordinates such that I get a numerically stable evolution? How can I set up initial data? And um, the observables I've already mentioned in the, in the very beginning. So let me just go uh, to the next slide here and um, talk about uh, gauge choices, so our choices for uh, labs and shift. Okay, yeah, and as I said, this is related to choosing the lapse function and shift vector. Okay, so first important note, if I take the simplest choice that I could possibly think of, so if I say, oh, you know, like, let me make my life easy and uh, take the lapse function to be one and my shift vector to be zero. That is, I uh, basically follow um, uh, evolution along normal vectors, then uh, one can show uh, that any uh, geodesic that you may travel along will actually inevitably um, enter uh, and end in the black hole singularity. Now, from a theoretical perspective, that may not be dramatic. From a numerical perspective, it is because if you hit a singularity, um, your code will just crash because you will uh, end up with divergences. Yeah, so message here, simple is not always the best solution. Yeah, in particular, if you take, for example, um, this really simple choice of laps equal one, shift equal zero, then we will reach the uh, singularity in the black hole space time, or just physical singularity in a finite time. Okay, so if I have to come up with a wish list of uh, what these gauge uh, conditions should be, and again, uh, because of this, um, uh, because it's just a gauge choice, we actually can. Um, have this freedom to specify uh, labs and shift. So if I have a wish list here, what do I want? Well, first of all, given the problem that I just mentioned, I want something that allows me to avoid um, reaching the singularity. Singularity. And there, uh, in numerical relativity, uh, two main uh, avenues of how we can do this. So we could either say, uh, ex, uh, use what we call excision of the inner region. Yeah, where I say if I, uh, I don't know, I have my numerical domain here and I know my black hole would sit here, then you would essentially cut out the interior so that you never um, get close to the um, singularity. The other uh, version, and that's what I'm going to talk about here, is a clever choice of coordinates. Um, such that your uh, foliation that your slices will never uh, touch the singularity uh, itself. Okay. The other thing uh, that's important, especially given the discussion that we just had is that um, the evolution equations together with our gauge uh, choices form a well posed uh, initial value from a uh, problem. Okay. And the last one, uh, as maybe more to taste, is something that uh, where I say I want something that is easy to implement. 
and um, efficient to evolve. So for example, if I were to come up with uh, elliptic equations for my laps and shift, which were um, conceived in the, in the late 90s, um, they're perfectly fine and you can uh, evolve them. The problem is that you would have to solve for these elliptic equations at every uh, time slice or every so many time slices. So that can make your uh, numerical evolution quite expensive if you uh, uh, think about uh, evolving a three-dimensional uh, uh, space-time. Uh, typically it was 10 to the 7, 10 to the 8, 10 to the 9 grid points, right? So if you have to uh, solve an elliptic equation or a set of elliptic equations at each time, then that becomes very expensive numerically. So uh, instead, what we would want is a set of a hyperbolic equation. So this would just give us a, a, an additional set of uh, time evolution equations together with our evolution equations that we already have. So. Yeah, so it's quite common to have um, time evolution equations for uh, lapse and shift. And I will just talk about uh, one set of equations. So uh, that's what's typically um, known or referred to as puncture gauge. So let me just uh, go into a little bit more detail about this. Um, so first of all, um, this uh, is a combination of a condition for the laps. And I will write down what this is in a moment uh, together with um, what we call gamma driver equation for the shift. Okay, so um, let's just talk about the laps first. And let's take a simple choice, choice one where we say, oh, let's just take a slicing um, that is maximal, that is where the trace of my extrinsic curvature or my expansion is zero. Okay. So if I uh, insert this in my, um, evolution equation for um, the extrinsic curvature and combine that with the constraints, uh, then I can find the following relation that uh, minus the Laplacian of alpha plus uh, laps times our Ricci scalar equals to zero. So in some sense, I can uh, rewrite this as something that goes like alpha uh, or where, where laps goes like something e to the minus uh, some curvature. So this is very schematic. Um, if you want to uh, have that uh, in detail, I would suggest you uh, follow the calculation or look at the textbook. But the point here is the following that um, uh, with this kind of choice, uh, the lapse collapses to zero as we approach uh, the physical uh, singularity. And this is already uh, one of the conditions that we had on our wish list that we find um, a slicing, uh, a form of our foli foliation um, that avoids um, the singularity. So, um, Here's a singularity, um, and one can show um, that in this case, the spatial uh, hypersurfaces 
cannot be arbitrarily close to, our, uh, to the physical singularity. And this is what we typically refer to as singularity avoidance or And this is what we want, right? So we want something where just by the choice of our labs and shift, we uh, avoid the physical singularity so that we can uh, evolve uh, a smooth uh, set of functions. Now, uh, this maximal slicing condition uh, that I've written down here would give us uh, a set of elliptic equations. So this is not exactly uh, what we want. But it does inform uh, the choice of uh, then hyperbolic slicing conditions. So uh, item B are hyperbolic slicing conditions. And here, um, let me just write down the more general form. And that goes back to uh, Bonner and Masso, where we have a time evolution equation for the lapse that in general could be written as minus lapse squared times some function of the lapse times the trace of the extrinsic curvature minus some background curvature. Okay, so this is a very general form. Now, if we were to choose this function f of alpha to be two over alpha, then we find the standard, what we call one plus log slicing condition, which is typically used in uh, simulations together with uh, um, BSIS N or Z4 type formulations. Uh, you can also find uh, for a different choice of this function, actually a relation to uh, the harmonic gauge that I mentioned earlier, just not going to write this down here. So uh, let's focus on this uh, one plus log slicing condition here. That is, we have now something where the time evolution of our labs is determined by minus two times alpha times the extrinsic curvature, trace of extrinsic curvature minus some background uh, curvature. Okay, so if we um, time, um, yeah, so we just take a moment to actually um, write this down in a Penrose diagram just so that we can see how the slices determined by those equations uh, would evolve. So let me just take a short uh, the Penrose diagram for Schwarzschild. Here, yeah, so we have our horizon um, here. And say um, we have some uh, time of or some uh, spatial slice here. So this would be one of our slices, uh, sigma t. Now, as uh, this continues inside uh, or into the interior, what will happen is that uh, our slices will actually uh, end up uh, uh, up here. It's quite fast. And my drawing is not ideal, but what happens as you evolve this in time, instead of actually going to the singularity, it will evolve oops, and avoid um, this uh, region near the singularity where this. Uh, defining or a line here one can show is essentially given by three over two M. So our slicing um, will never get closer to the uh, singularity uh, than this uh, value here. Okay, so and that's uh, essentially a slicing that smooths across the horizon, avoids the singularity and 
gives us a time evolution equation that's easy to implement. So this is something that we tend to uh, use in most numerical simulations or a version thereof. Okay, so uh, last set of equation, um, and I will just write it down on the next uh, slide, um, which is for our uh, shift condition. So, and again, um, one uh, can have different choices here. We tend to use um, what we call the gamma driver condition. Uh, and again, I'm not going to go into to the derivation and re would refer you to the textbooks for this. So what we have here is a time evolution equation for the shift um, that is given by uh, one coefficient, let me just call this beta gamma, times a quantity, and I will define this quantity in a minute, uh, gamma tilde i, which is called conformal connection function. So this is related to, um, sorry. Uh, okay, one can show that this is related to uh, the gradient of the metric. And I'm going to put a tilde on here because it's a conformal metric that I haven't introduced here. So that's why I was hesitating a little bit. So as a gist message here, um, this conformal connection function is related to the divergence of our three metric. Yeah. So in other words, as uh, for example, we have a binary system that uh, evolves uh, and as these, our binaries are orbiting around each other, the space time itself um, will be dragged along, will be stretched. So what this term does essentially is counteracting this uh, stretch so that we never have two large gradients um, in our space time. And um, the second term here is an advection term um, that goes like beta i. Yeah, so that's the idea here. And again, if you uh, now actually go take uh, this condition for the shift, so the condition for the labs that I've written down and um, together with the BSSN formulation, one can actually prove that that is a strongly hyperbolic system of partial differential equations. So they form a well, mathematically well-posed uh, system of equations. And um, indeed that's what a large number of numerical gro uh, relativity groups uh, use uh, in their evolutions. And that's also what you uh, would find, for example, in the Einstein toolkit in the McLachlan uh, thorns. Yeah, so we have uh, the BSSN equations with these gauge conditions there. We also have a slightly different version of the evolution equations where you add uh, constraint damping, um, but I'm not going to go into any of the details uh, about this here. Okay, so um, the last about 10 minutes that I have, I will very, very, very briefly uh, talk about initial conditions. And instead of going through the construction for the initial data, which would be a whole lesson uh, and lecture on its own, uh, let me just give you uh, a couple of examples um, for um, black hole initial data, yeah? So um, before I go there, let me just quickly stop um, to ask if there are any questions and to check if there's anything on the chat. Okay, good. I don't see anything. So I will just um, take the last uh, 10 minutes to talk about um, initial conditions for uh, black holes in a, again, very, very short form. So I think this should be section five now, uh, initial uh, data for, uh, Let me just put it this way. Um, okay, so conceptually, what we uh, have to do here is the following. So, um, what we want is a prescription for our stream metric 
and extrinsic curvature at t equals zero. Yeah, each um, of, so what we have here, if we count the degrees of freedom are uh, 12 degrees of freedom that we have to specify. And four of these will be specified um, using the constraints. So we will um, solve uh, the Hamiltonian and momentum constraint. But as I said, so this fixes four degrees of freedom. So we also actually have to give a bit more input and uh, make a couple of assumptions of the type of solutions that we are looking for. Um, okay, so <clears throat> as I said, I'm not going to go into uh, the details. Um, and we'll instead just give you uh, one, uh, one example here. And let me start with the first example of just a single non-rotating black hole. And let's just pretend um, non-rotating, not boosted. Just be very specific. Okay. In four dimensions, asymptotically flat space times. Okay. What do we already know about this kind of space time? Now, the first thing that we know is that it's actually time symmetric. So there's no uh, linear or angular momentum. Oops. So we know it's time symmetric. That is the extrinsic curvature Kij equals to zero. Now, if we uh, go back to our constraints, let me just write down the momentum constraint here. Um, then this is trivially satisfied. So we don't actually have to worry about this one. And what we uh, uh, now need to solve is the Hamiltonian constraint. And again, let me just um, write this uh, down again so we have seen that this was given by um, the Ricci scalar um, with these terms for the extrinsic curvature. So since this is uh, now zero for our space time, we only have to solve this equation here. Now, of course, this is still uh, an elliptic uh, equation for our metric. So we uh, uh, will do a few more simplifying assumptions. And first of all, uh, what we will take is an uh, ansatz for the metric where we say, okay, let's write our physical metric gamma ij that we want to solve for as a conformal factor times some background metric or uh, some conformal metric, sorry. So conformal factor. some conformal metric. And actually let's make our life even easier and assume that our uh, conformal metric is flat. And this is in fact, one of the choices uh, that we can make. Yeah, so. Okay, good. So the other input um, that we will 
take is the following that we say, okay, uh, we want to look for a solution in an asymptotically flat space time. So let's make this uh, explicit and uh, make that a condition. So we say that we want to look at uh, asymptotically flat space times. That means uh, we can now identify a boundary condition for our conformal factor um, that psi uh, goes uh, to one as we approach spatial infinity. Now, if we uh, insert that in uh, our Hamiltonian constraint, we will find um, a flat space Laplacian acting on psi equals to zero. Now, and that is an equation that we know how to solve. So here are the um, solution that we can find is the conformal factor goes like um, one plus some constant over um, the radius. So where the co constant here just comes from our boundary condition. Um, and then we know that the uh, Laplace equation can be solved by one over our type dependence. Now we can identify uh, this constant uh, as follows. M over, uh, so mass of our black hole over two, that is, our conformal factor will become one plus m over two r. And now let's write this uh, down in the metric. We see that we find that our metric is uh, given by minus laps squared dt squared. The shift here in the space time is zero plus psi to the four flat uh, spatial metric dxi dxj. And if we uh, look at our textbooks, we will see that this is nothing else but the Schwarzschild metric in isotropic coordinates. And this is a uh, first type of initial condition uh, that we can have. And that's actually something that we can uh, easily extend to uh, multiple black holes. So if we have, um, let me just write it as N black holes. Without any momentum, so no spin and no boost, then we can simply superpose uh, the solutions that we uh, have here. So, because Laplacian, the Laplacian is linear, so um, we find a solution for our conformal factor that can be written as one plus, and now just the sum um, over uh, the number of black holes that we have, where here we have some a bare mass parameter divided by two, and then we have the distance, um, or the, uh, the location of our uh, ace black hole. Yeah, so this is some bare mass parameter. And this is our location of uh, each of the black holes. And this is what we refer to as Brill Lindquist uh, initial data. And what that gives you is essentially initial conditions for uh, black holes colliding just head on without any momentum. Now, of course, we are interested in uh, space times as uh, black holes that are um, on uh, quasi circular orbits. So we need to give them a boost. So we need to add the linear momentum. One minute. I have uh, one minute. I will just write down the names. 
um, for you to look this up um, to know uh, what's implemented in the Einstein toolkit. Um, so the last one here is what we typically call, hmm, okay, so I still have this listed as Bowen York data. I will add uh, in a second because that was actually extended by uh, Brandt and Brickman for multiple black holes. Yeah, and this gives you um, initial data for black holes with a linear um, and or angular momenta. Yeah, and again, I'm not going to go into the details here, but uh, in the Einstein toolkit, uh, this type of data is implemented in the two punctures, uh, SORN, uh, where you can just use it to set up uh, initial conditions for uh, uh, binaries on quasi-circular orbits. Okay, and given the time, uh, basically at the end of my uh, lecture, um, I would take a couple of questions now. I would also stay on during the break if you want to discuss anything in, in a little bit more detail. And I thank you for your attention. So I think everything from now on will actually be more hands-on and uh, more tutorial-like. But I thought uh, for all of those of you who are new to numerical relativity, I hope that gave you a little bit of an idea of what's behind uh, the code, what's behind the implementations. So thank you very much. Thank you. This was a great presentation and a really useful lecture. Thank you very much. Um, so we are in the break time, but I said questions can be asked. Uh, if you're happy to stay around, then this would be great. Um, I'll probably in the middle of the break or so stop the recording so I have a break in the recording. Um, mm -hmm. But otherwise, it just goes through. Nothing changes. Same link, same everything. Okay, very good. Uh, can I have a question? Uh, oh yeah, of course. Is, so uh, in the uh, in solving the constraint equations, we had uh, twelve independent components, right? Mm -hmm. um, so that's the gammas and the k's, uh, and we have four constraint equations. So that gives us eight. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, eight parameters, and in this uh, in this example, we supplied uh, six equations by uh, saying the time symmetry, mm -hmm. and I was uh, and the mm, the remaining two degrees of freedom are supplied. Um, in what way? Um, okay, so this is exactly where I was um, just very very sketchy. Uh, so what we have or what I have done here implicitly is to uh, take my metric, gamma ij, and I actually performed a conformal decomposition. Remember, I wrote down this, um, so if I may go, yeah, let me just go back uh, to the uh, previous uh, page here. So remember, I wrote down this ansatz for the metric here. Yeah, and that actually fixes uh, some of the remaining degrees of freedom. So here, uh, we now have the conformal factor which is one, one of the degrees of freedom that we are actually solving for. And then we uh, fix the remaining ones by um, defining our choice for the conformal metric. Okay, so there's just one degree of freedom left and that's the so and sorry. Yeah, precisely. So, uh, and, and that's where uh, usually if I would give a full lecture on this, I would be a little bit more detailed, uh, but exactly. So here we say, okay, we have our physical uh, three-dimensional metric, which has six degrees of freedom. Um, and we uh, uh, can take this uh, conformal ansatz that goes back to uh, Lignerowitz in the 1940s, um, where we say we have some conformal factor and then a conformal metric. And I fix some of the degrees of freedom by choosing what this conformal metric is. Okay, and this conformal ansatz, it works only in the case of, uh, I'm sorry if I'm uh, bringing it up all, uh, all the time, uh, asymptotically mm -hmm. flat space times, or, or is it more universal than that? Um, it's, 
more universal than that. Um, so back in the day when uh, we simulated um, black hole collisions in desit and asymptotically desitter space times, we used a very similar ansatz. Um, I haven't done this for asymptotically anti desitter space times, but I would imagine that you can uh, use something very similar. So, uh, you know, I mean, this is uh, more of a guess. Uh, I think uh, if you were to replace your conformal metric with a, um, a, a ADS metric, you could probably follow through in a, in a similar way. You just would have to be more careful about the boundary conditions, right? Um, I could also mention, um, so that's something that I have done when I was interested in um, performing simulations of high, of single highly rotating black holes um, coupled to uh, extra fields. So what I did there as an ansatz was to use uh, not the flat metric, but the Kerr metric as my conformal metric, as my seat, uh, so to say. Um, yeah, so uh, in most textbooks, you would probably find this conformally flat metric ansatz, but it's actually more general. Yeah, so you can have this conformal metric here. You just need to, so if you take a, a different type of metric or want to keep it uh, more general, you just need to go through the uh, motions um, more carefully. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. Any other questions? <laughs> 